This int vector class that we've been building up over the past few videos is now a pretty convincing vector. In terms of the operations that we got used to initially, so things like push back and dot add and iterating over it with indices, it can now do all of those things. Now, it's obviously missing the ability to work with any element type, so it's just a vector of ints for now. We don't yet have the angle bracket notation. We're going to see that at the end of this week. But it does otherwise look a lot like an actual vector. There is one technical issue that we need to solve, though. And it's not obvious, and it's actually very hard to construct an example that produces the error in the same way you would likely see it in practice. If you were to take this int vector type, though, and go back and use it in place of std vector in some of the examples we did early in this semester, so some of our introductory vector examples, you would eventually notice some weird behavior. You'd probably, when you got to the examples that um, where functions were taking vectors by value, so before we learned about passing by reference, we saw that we could pass copies of vectors by value. We saw that the second law of assignment statements applied to vectors. Um, so, of course, when I have have two vectors and I assign one to the other, so something like what I'm doing on line 125 here, I should still have two independent things. Um, you would notice if you tried using the int vector class in cases where copies were needed that something weird would happen eventually. And uh, it would come up in a certain context, probably passing them into functions. But to illustrate the problem better, I have concocted this example that is a little bit artificial, but I think can show off what's really happening a lot more concisely. So on line 107, I'm making a vector called v1. And it's set to the sequence 6, 10, 17, 187. And then, and then I, I enter this uh, area part A, and I construct a new vector called v2, and I do it by copy construction. So we've seen already the, the um, various ways we can copy things. We probably weren't used to this way of copying things until recently, even though this is what's happening when you pass a vector into a function. We're more, more used to copy assignment, but we'll see that in a minute. So I construct a vector v2, and we know what to expect here. So we know that we expect v2 to be its own independent thing that just happens to contain all of the same elements as v1. So that's it. Um, and once we've done the copy, v1 and v2 are independent. They don't depend on each other in any way. Um, OK, so then I print out v2 once. And I should expect, of course, v2 to contain what I've written here. Then I modify v1. And this is the usual, this is actually sort of a, a variant of a problem that we've seen going back to 111. This issue of just because two variables happen to be equal once doesn't mean they're equal to each other forever. v1 and v2 are two separate things. So line 119, which performs this modification, so v1's first element is now 999, line 119 should not change v2. v2 should still be 6, 10, 17, 187. But let's keep going. I, I then make a new vector on line 124 called v3. And I then set v3 to equal v1 using an assignment statement. So line 125 isn't a copy construction because v3 already exists. I can't construct it again. Uh, and so now v3 should equal a copy of what v1 currently contains. So 999, 10, 17, 187. And then I modify v1 again. v1.at index 2 equals negative 1. So I should expect v1 to be this and then v2 to be the original elements, and v3 to be the elements after part a. So the first element is 999. Everything else is unchanged. I'm going to run the code. It's going to run. I'm allowed to perform these two operations on the vector that we've already been working on. We've seen already that if you do not provide your own copy constructor, the compiler gives you one. The point of this video is to show that the one it gives you isn't enough for this. The basic copy constructor and copy assignment operators do not do the trick for these vectors. So we'll try running this, and we will notice a few disturbing things. First, in part A, the two print statements are printing out v2, just v2. v1 never gets printed in this entire program. It prints out v2 before it modifies v1, line 118. v2 is correct. Line 120, we've just modified v1, and the modification should not change v2. And yet on line, uh, the print statement, we've noticed that v2 changed. That is incorrect. Something about the copy went wrong. When I made a copy of v1 into v2, somehow they ended up stuck together. Somehow when I changed v1, the change propagated into v2. Line 124, so now we're in part b. And in part b, I print out v3 twice. I never print out v1 or v2. I print v3 the first time, and the elements are what I expect them to be. 999, 10, 7, 1, 8, 10 17, 187. I modify v1, and now the modification has been reflected in v3. That is invalid. 
And for extra certainty, it turns out if I were to print out V2 again, that would actually be reflected in, the modification would be reflected in V2 as well. So here we can see v, V2 and V3 both end up staying equal to V1 the whole time. They've ended up stuck together because the copy operation the compiler gave us wasn't sufficient. Um, but something even worse happens, which is we then get to the end of May. So that's line 133, this print statement. Nothing else happens after that. So we should understand that what's happening after line 133 is destruction. So we're doing the destruction of V2, V3, V2, and V1 in that order. The program crashes though. Something about the destruction process messes it up and it crashes. We can see it gives the same aborted message that we get when an exception gets thrown out of main, but this is not an exception. This is something else. It's actually something scary, I think even more scary than usual, because the word free sounds a lot like something out of CSC 111. Weren't we done with that? Don't we not worry about free anymore? Don't we care about new and delete? Well, okay, spoiler alert, it turns out that the new operator and the delete operator in C++ generally actually are wrappers around malloc and free. A lot of C++ stuff can be boiled down to C features with some extra, I don't know, magic thrown into them. And one of them, the new and delete operators are in fact C++ variants of the malloc and free functions that take care of the extra work we know is required in C++ like construction and destruction. But deep down they call malloc and free. So the C free function has had to get involved here and we don't want that to happen. So our goal in this video is to fix the actual, the obvious um, logic errors that seem to be occurring in the copy, and also, of course, to ensure that we can use our vectors without them crashing the program when the program ends. So what's the problem? Why is the compiler not able to give us a copy operator that makes sense? And to do that, I'm going to have to sketch um, some detailed diagrams, which I don't normally like doing on, on my screen like this. I like using a separate program for that, but we're going to put up with it. So let's look at our vectors v1, v2, and v3. So here's our vector v1. What does v1 contain? v1 contains three members. Uh, there's a member called vector size. I'm just going to call that size for the sake of the example. There's a member called capacity. And then finally, there is a pointer to the storage array. I'm going to actually have to knock down this wall to fit that whole thing in. Um, so the vector v1 contains these three members. All right, and of course, we expect that V2 and V3 contain the same three members. Um, for brevity, I'm just going to draw the boxes for them. I'm not going to actually draw in the names, but I think you get the idea. Um, okay, so there's V2, and then finally, down here a bit, I'll pass, I'll, I'll just uh, sketch out V3. So there's V2, and there's V3. And all three of them contain the same, they obviously all as instances of the same object have three members, the size, the capacity, and the pointer to the storage array. One thing to observe right off the bat though is that what I'm really storing, the member on line 93 here, is a pointer to a storage array. The array itself isn't part of the class. I know this because if I just had a C-style array in the class, that array would be scoped the way the class was. The whole point of the storage array, the whole point of the vector object, was that I should be allowed to create and destroy storage arrays whenever I want. So I use the new and delete operations. And that's why all I'm storing in the class is a pointer to the array because the array itself is governed by the new and delete operators, governed by dynamic allocation. So what happens then when I create v1 is we create this storage array, there it is, um, and we get back a pointer to it. So v1 now has a pointer to my storage array. Uh, and then it has its own size and its own capacity. Okay, great. So th that's great. That's been working fine so far. We've had vectors. We've been working with them. And we know that we can do pushback. We can resize the storage array, whatever. But then I make a copy, line 115. And I have not written my own copy constructor. We're going to have to do that in this video, but I haven't done that yet. So on line 115, I do the copy, and it lets me. The compiler lets me do this, because when I don't provide a copy constructor, it provides one for me. The one it provides for me performs what is called a shallow copy. So by default, what the compiler generates for you when you ask, when you use a copy constructor that, when you ask for the default copy constructor, the compiler generates a shallow copy. What's a shallow copy? A shallow copy is where we take every member of the thing we're copying and just copy it over with, you could think of it like an assignment statement. The size of V2 is assigned the size of V1. The capacity of V2 is assigned the capacity of V1. The storage pointer for V2 is assigned the storage pointer for V1. Notice that although v1 and v2 do have their own independent sizes and capacities, they share a storage array because the pointer was copied, not the actual array. The array wasn't duplicated because the array lives outside of the object. Instead, the compiler did a shallow copy. It just copied each member of v1 into each member of v2. 
Um, before I talk further about that, I want to show what happens on line 125. The default copy assignment operator is also a shallow copy. If I want something else, I have to define it myself. And so when I copy v1 into v3, well, v3's size is 6, v3's capacity is 10, and the storage array pointer points to the same storage array that I use for v1 and v2. So all three of v1 and v2, uh, v2 and v3 are fighting over this one storage array, which produces obvious problems in my small test case, but it would get a lot worse if I was using vectors the way I typically do. So pushing lots of elements into both things, because they're both trying to now resize the same array, which of course is going to make a mess. And that brings us to this thing happening at the end of main. So why are we getting an error happening down in a part of the program where all that's going on is object destruction. So what's happening between line 133 and the end of the program? Well, there are three variables I've created, v1, v2, and v3, and they're all being destroyed. And of course, they actually have non-trivial destructors. Um, and a destructor is something we've been, we've spent a long time on destructors, but it wasn't until we got to this class, this int vector class, that we saw a legitimate use for one ourselves. You probably believe that there were legitimate uses, but we never saw a case where we really needed one ourselves, just sort of trivial destructors that print stuff out. But in um, the int vector class, where the storage array is dynamically allocated, we are responsible for deallocating it. So the destructor for v1, v2, and v3 does have to do something meaningful, that is to call the delete operator on the storage array. Okay, the next question is, what order do I use for destruction? Well, by the law of socks and shoes, I should be destructing v3 first. So I call the destructor for v3, and the destructor for v3 calls delete, the delete operator on this storage array, the same storage array that v2 and v1 are using. Okay, the destructor does that, the storage array gets deleted, and then v3 gets destroyed. So we'll just erase it to indicate that it's gotten destroyed. But main isn't done. Main has not destroyed its other variables yet. So main calls the destructor for v2. The destructor for v2 then attempts to delete this very same thing. But this is already gone. It's just wreckage floating around in space. And once you call delete on this array, you can never use it again, including to try and delete it again. But v2 is trying to delete an array that was already deleted. It's trying to delete it twice. And when, I, when the delete operator runs, it eventually calls the old c free function, and the free function then throws a tantrum. It says, I'm sorry, you cannot free the same object twice. I have no idea what you mean by that. And it reports that as double free. You cannot free twice. You cannot perform a double free and the program crashes. And this is really just the same issue we were already having. It's the shallow copy problem. This storage array wasn't supposed to be shared among all three objects, but it was by accident. Because of the shallow copy, I was sharing this thing that was supposed to be separate. So my goal here, because the copy assignment and copy um, initialization that was provided by the compiler is insufficient, I have to now write my own. I don't want a shallow copy. I want what is called a deep copy. Okay, so the next question then, of course, is what is a deep copy? And I'll just hastily erase this because I want to recycle part of my diagram. Um, a deep copy is where when I make a copy of an object, I don't just copy the values of each of the members. I copy everything, whatever that means for the type, I copy everything all the way through. So for example, if v1 had its own storage array, and I want to copy v1 into v2, I will now manually copy size to size, capacity to capacity, um, and then make my own storage array for v2. There we go. Now v1 and v2 are truly separate. Of course, that means if v1 had some elements, I have to copy those elements manually into v2. But I can do that. That's all valid. Um, I could write my very own copy constructor that does that. Um, but there actually are some tricks I could use to work around that. There's a short way and a long way. I'm going to try and demonstrate both. And I'm going to try and prove to you that the short way is actually sort of better. Because in general, it's better to write code that works and then worry about making the code work fast. So the goal here is I'm going to write a deep copy um, copy constructor. And then later I'm going to write a deep copy copy assignment operator. Okay, so I'm just going to compile this again to make sure I haven't broken anything in the meantime. There we go. So we'll go up here and we'll write a deep copy um, copy uh, constructor. So that's this. And I'm going to put a comment saying this is the long way. Okay, so I'm going to write a copy constructor. Uh, it's going to take as its argument the thing we're copying, so the other thing that I'm copying. And the goal of the copy constructor now is to take every element of this vector and put it into this one. 
Okay, well, that sounds fine. Um, and so I'll begin by initializing all of my members. I'm going to do this with assignment statements. Uh, I could do it in this fashion here. I'm going to do it with assignment statements just, I think, because it reads easier on the video. I will initialize my storage array pointer to be a null pointer. Okay, so how big do I need this vector to be if it's going to be a copy of the other vector? Well, I guess I need it to be just as big as the other vector is. In fact, I can go grab the other vector's capacity myself. I could even make my shallow copy one line at a time here. Um, I want the size of this vector to be the size of the other vector. But I don't want the storage array to be the same. Because what I'm doing on line 27 and 28 is making a copy. I'm saying my capacity is, is a distinct variable from the other capacity. But I want it to be the same value, so I copy it in. I want my storage array to have the same to be um, an array of the same size as the other vector. But I don't want it to be the same array. Um, so I'll do this. So I have my own capacity, and then I will initialize my storage array to be a brand new array with the same capacity as the other vector. And now I will copy each element in manually. So I say, okay, let's do, start a variable i at zero. i is less than the size of the other vector. Oh, whoops, I should say vector size. So size is a member function. The name of the member is vector size. I could just call the member function to get the size, but since I'm working with the vector size member myself, I might as well, I think it's more consistent to do this. Uh, and then i plus plus. So what I'll do is I'll just go grab every element of the other storage array, uh, and I will put it into my storage array. So storage at index i equals uh, I'm going to do this raw, so I'm not going to bother with member functions, other.storage at index i. All right. Uh, okay, so now what I've done is I have made a deep copy. Some things get copied in a shallow way because they can be. Just integer variables are easy to copy. And that's why the default copy construction op uh, the, the default copy construction that you get usually works. All semester we've been using copy constructors that are provided by the compiler. Even since we were talking about basic structure types way earlier, like week three or four, we were using the fact that when you define your own structure type, the compiler defines a copy constructor for it that is a shallow copy. Shallow copies aren't inherently bad, but there are places where we reach their limit, and this is one of them. Here, the copy requires more work, so I'm doing a deep copy. Um, okay, and so I think my deep copy is now complete. We'll try testing our code again, and this time see whether our issue in part A has been resolved. So we're still going to have a problem at the end and in part B because we haven't finished our copy assignment operator. But notice, in part A, when I print out v2 and then I modify v1 and print out v2 again, v2 is still the same. So my modification to v1, we'll just scroll down to take a look at that, my modification to v1 between the two print statements did not modify v2. So I think that's a sign that I actually was able to perform legitimately a deep copy. Okay, that's the long way to write the copy constructor. I do everything um, by hand, I guess. Um, what's the short way? The short way leverages the fact that all of what I've done here is actually already present elsewhere in the class. So here's the short way. This is le going to leverage member functions. Because actually, if I think about adding elements to a vector, haven't I already written that functionality into the vector somewhere? So the short way would be to, OK, so I'm going to define my copy constructor. I'm actually going to steal the signature I already wrote. So there we go. Um, and so there's my copy constructor just like before. What I would like to do is add each element of the other vector to this vector. I'm going to begin by taking a shortcut. Um, actually, I'm, before I'm going to make a, just some copy editing, I'm going to put this here. Um, what I'm going to begin by doing is calling, I'm going to delegate to the default constructor. I'm going to say, hey, that default constructor sure is pretty good at setting up my vector to be empty. It creates, it sets the size to zero, the capacity to be 10, and it sets the storage array to be a new array of the right capacity. This notation says, OK, when you're going to run the copy constructor, begin by running the default constructor. Delegate to that. So that means as of line 26, I should assume that the default constructor has just finished running, which means that my storage array is now valid. Now what I'm going to do is say all I need to do to copy the elements of this uh, vector, the other one, into the current one, are to go through its elements and then add them to the end of my vector. Don't I have a function in the current vector that can do that? Well, yeah, it's called push back. So what about this trick? Um, start, I'm just going to iterate over all the elements of the other vector. So i is less than other dot, um, I'm going to call the member function just to prove my point. So I'm going to iterate over the vector just like it's any other vector I might encounter in the program. I'm not actually even going to use the private member access that I have, given that I'm inside the in vector class. I'm allowed to use the members of the other vector directly. I'm not even going to do that. Instead, I'm going to get each um, element of the other vector, and I'm going to use push back to uh, add it to the end of this vector. 
So basically, this is how I might make a copy of a vector in main. I don't even need private member access to do this. And the advantage of this is I already know that pushback works. I already know that my default constructor works. Because I'm writing less code, there are less places that I could make a mistake. Um, and if we run it, we can see it still works. The short way also works. The way where I basically uh, push all of the effort onto stuff that I've already written. Now you might stare at this and say, this does seem like it's, it'll actually end up taking longer than the other way. By doing everything raw by hand, I'm saving operations because pushback contains a bunch of logic that this doesn't. In particular, if I start my vector at size 10, like I'm doing here uh, with the default constructor, and the other vector is massive, maybe pushback has to do a bunch of resize operations to get this to work. That's true. I claim that there are still ways to make the short way work that are basically the same amount of work as the long way for the computer, but less work for you. One example would be I could resize the capacity of this vector to match the capacity of the other vector. That would be one way to make sure pushback doesn't have to do any resizing while I'm working on it. Um, and there are a couple of other fixes I might do to save a bit of time. But I really like this solution, and I would argue that in the spirit of this course, where we care about making the code work before we make it fast, this is a great solution to the deep copy problem, because it moves as much of the tedious labor as possible onto member functions that we've already tested and know to be correct. So it's one less place for stuff to go wrong. Okay, so we've seen the short way and the long way for um, copy construction. And now I want the same thing for copy assignment. Um, it's true that copy assignment can work with both the short way and the long way, but because you've already seen the long way, I imagine you could see how to generalize it to copy assignment. So I'm going to do um, just the short way for copy assignment. We know that the copy assignment uh, operators, if we write our own assignment operators, they should always return the current object. Um, return star this, uh, which we saw in a previous video. So I know it's odd, but that's why you'll notice that that's what I'm doing here. Um, and it takes as its argument, as the other operand of the equal sign, the uh, vector to copy. And really what I'm going to do is basically just the same thing as the short way for my copy construction, except I'm not going to call the default constructor first because I can't. In the equals operator, I'm not allowed to reconstruct the current object. But what I need to do first is clear the current vector. So when I do the equal sign, I don't want the elements of the new vector, the thing I'm copying in, to get appended to my existing vector. I want to completely replace whatever is currently in my vector with the contents of this. So to do that, I'll just clear out my current vector. Clear any elements currently in the vector. Um, and we know already because of what we did with the pop back function that because of the encapsulation, if you want to delete an element from the vector, all I have to do is to decrement the size. And then from your point of view, the vector now doesn't have the element in it. So to generalize that even further, if I want to clear the vector, if I just set the size to zero, as far as you're concerned, the vector now has zero elements. So clearing the vector is actually surprisingly easy. So I clear the vector, then I, I loop over the other vector, and I just add every element with push back, and that'll do the trick. There is a long way where I manually reset the size capacity, delete the current storage array, make a brand new one, and then copy everything in. Um, it would be almost the same as the code we wrote earlier with one addition, which is I have to delete the existing storage array before I recreate create it. Um, other than that, you can do it both ways. I think the short way is very elegant. So we'll compile that. Oh, whoops. And um, that's interesting. So uh, the compiler is warning me that I did forget one thing, which is that my equals operator was supposed to return something, a reference to an int vector object. And we recall from talking about the assignment operator that when we write an assignment operator, we customarily write return star this. We return the current object, which allows us to chain together assignments. I could write v1 equals v2 equals v3, which would be interpreted like this, which would mean that I, the assignment operator um, here would return v2. So that is to say, v2 being the left-hand side of the assignment, it just returns itself. So we're already aware that return star this is the normal notation for the end of an assignment operator. If you notice my pause there when I looked at the warning, so the warning was correct. I had forgotten that line. What was neat to me was that the compiler actually told me what to add. Add. The compiler could read my mind. It figured out exactly what I wanted. Usually it just says, sorry, can't do it. But you'll notice the compiler gave the warning. Usually when it prints something out, it's a line that isn't present. Or sorry, a line that is present that's, that's incorrect. Here, this line actually wasn't there. The compiler knew that's what I wanted to add and suggested it to me. So I think the compiler is actually being quite helpful. It's in a much better mood this week than it was last week. Um, okay, so return star this. So I thank the compiler for its nice little warning there. Although in this example, it wouldn't have been too big of a deal. Um, it's still pretty good that, that we, we add that. Um.
Okay, run that and we take a look. Um, in main, so back down to our testing code in main, here I print v2 out twice and I expect it to be unchanged. And sure enough, it is unchanged. I then print out in part b, I print out v3. And v3 should be these four elements. And it is. I then change v1 and I, I print v, v3 again. And v3 hasn't changed, which is good because it wasn't supposed to have. And then for certainty, I print v2. And v2 also hasn't changed. And then I get to the end of main and the program doesn't crash. So what I've done is I have written my own copy operations, copy construction, copy assignment, that perform deep copies. And because I'm performing a deep copy, I no longer have that problem of three vectors fighting over the same storage array. The problem that occurs when you, when you use the default copy operations provided by the compiler, which performs shallow copies. And so I'm almost done making my vector uh, mimic everything we needed early in the course. The one thing I have left to talk about is what happens if I want to construct a vector uh, where in the constructor I provide all of the initial elements? That's the one thing left, and it's the topic of, of the next video.